That's pretty true. Ooh. Yep. We're getting a little. <laughs> <laughs> this is yeah, this is chatting yeah, presentation. Yeah, okay. yeah, can you hang that up? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Got about a two second delay. Yeah, I love watching myself trying to hang this up here. I don't know how to use an Android phone. So inside your browser, it's going to Google. So you can send Hey, that's my disclaimer. No, no, no. Before I say anything, let me show how I know. But little I know about Android. I know. I'm like anti Android, and he's asking me that. No, him. I know, but he was asking me like, no, how to close out of it. By me being able to program for Android means I know every application that Android supports. I'm yeah. sorry. Like, .NET people automatically know everything about Excel and work. Well, so the more sense you can program a VCR, what? You know, you know everything about computers, right? It's good. Or a thermostat. Plus, I Google that. If you have a computer science degree, I mean, I'll see you in a I know how to use every. Yeah, yeah he's quoting like right. printers. My mom um, thinks that. Yeah, oh, yeah, science, science degree. I know how to fix your septic system. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and go to school. Yeah. If it's powered by uh, electricity, you know how to do it. Don't answer it. Uh, answer it. <laughs> you turn on the phone again? He just asked me if it was okay. I said, fine. So, uh, John will actually be presented first. That sounds good. We can get this set up. And yeah, is it easier? Well, yeah. Both of them have to be in the pod. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, well, well. Well, well. Jose Canseco has a plan to colonize the galaxy using comets. Say Jose Canseco? I said Jose Canseco. Are we recording yours or not? That's your one. Yeah. Cool. Can you mute your computer? Hey man. I can I can really sleepy and then once you're uh I have some surprise, S P A S P A G at Gmail. That's sweet. Just do whatever you need to do. Are you gonna be sharing from your screen one or screen two? I'm trying to do it. Yeah. Oh. Right, cool. 
How do you get to that word document or the PowerPoint that I need to put together? How do you get to oh, this guy? Let's go ahead and get started. Everyone, welcome to the November Code and Beer meeting. Uh, today we have the fabulous John Riley, who will be presenting on uh, spinning up virtual environments using Bot Starter. So that's going to be a, a quick lightning talk. And then we have the wonderful Kevin Mack. Oh, I'm sorry. Kevin. Kevin Good. <laughs> Uh, Android Wear, let's get each sheet. So that'll be interesting. A full presentation. And then for December, we just have holiday. We're kind of taking a break from presentations. So, you know, all the good stuff that comes with the holidays. <laughs> We're drunk uncles included, all that good stuff. We're if you guys are interested, we're kind of considering possibly doing some kind of, uh, you know, maybe unofficial or whatever, uh, happy hour or something in December. If that's something you'd like to do or have any interesting ideas for something you'd like to do, uh, let us know, put on your evals or whatever, and uh, we'll see what we can do there. Then into the next year, Alec Beats is doing a presentation on Connect 2.0 for Windows development. So that's going to be pretty cool. Um, also, Ryan Stryker, he was unfortunately couldn't make the catch of food tonight last month. So he's going to present it in January. And Fetch of Kucha, we all felt like was a really, really good success of a big hit. So sometime in 115, don't know when we're going to do another Fetch of Kucha night. So I think that was that went over very well. Uh, February 12th, uh, some of you may remember that John Fairchild was originally scheduled for tonight. Uh, there were scheduling conflicts, so he had to uh, push it back. He is now in February. And March 12th, we are thinking about doing another uh, workshop or kata, something fun, something exciting. Um, we would actually like if you could 
put ideas down in the eval forms. We're, we'll be compiling some ideas, and then the whole group will get to vote at some point on what we want to do. So think about that. Should be should be fun. Are you going to remind of all these things that are supposed to do here at the end? Uh, if you're interested in happy hour December and you uh, I mean, I'm sorry, workshop or Kata idea. So something you might want to hear. <clears throat> so that is it. And I'll hand it over to John Riley. <laughs> So I'm going to be talking to you about uh, Lockstar, which is a way of doing the virtual environment in minutes. Uh, this can become very useful for several applications. So, so for example, if you want to um, spin the developed environment, uh, developing a new virtual instance, you can do that. Um, you know, other applications where it might be uh, in a presentation, you want to present it to our CFS or something like that. And uh, you can install uh, TFS in the and um, demo it there. That's what you can do. So, a little bit of history where this came from. Uh, probably about uh, okay, three years old at this point now. Uh, we saw a new ad on a virtual studio called Vida. So, it's called Vida. And this tool. This add on giving us the ability to install other engines in Visual Studio that were in a package format. So we've never seen this package format before in a Windows environment. We've seen it years, years ago. Never saw it in a Windows environment. So this is really exciting because A, you didn't have to go to an install. And the other thing is that you uh, could do it really fast. It was, it was there. So, so this is a very, very nice. Uh, Nice add on to have. We were puzzled about well, in that it was just centered around Visual Studio. So, yeah, another, another little program, another application called Chocolate, came around a few years ago. This extended outside of Visual Studio and went to the rest of it. So now we have <coughs> packages we could install at the operating system level basically anything. So instead of, instead of writing the installation, we have this package to download and install in, in MIPS. That was just great. The thing is, is that this only works locally. So we kind of have to ask ourselves, how can we how could we do more? How do we do more with this? Here's an example. I have an Azure virtual machine. I want to be able to call my packages there. Not only that, I want to be able to push my install, my local to the Azure instance. So we needed that. Second thing is, we need to just use one URL for this. I want to ask you one URL from an IE instance or command line, and then just have it go. And that's the third thing is this we need this reboot What does that mean? That means that your reboots are handled gracefully. Okay? So, uh, if you're installed in the middle, if you're in the middle of the install, you have to redo, reinstall something else. You want that to handle gracefully. That's a problem with Windows because, as we all know, the system files are, are locked when we are in use, and then we have to be, uh, we have to reboot and <laughs> use a new version. So, all that, the chocolate. And everything I just talked about is Boxer. That's what it is. It's an application download from Boxer.org, and then you can use your own, use the function I would to create your installs. So, how does this all work? Well, basically, everything is built on PowerShell and Fusion. So, uh, a few commands that have been created in software began through Boxer to do the installation. So just about everything we do is through the scripting we do is through PowerShell. The execution of those scripts is through a URL. So this is how you do it. This is how you create an install session. The Boxer 
install section. And you'll see, I'll show you the screen in the next slide. But this is a basic uh, command to install package through PowerShell. So install box server package, and we'll give it a name or anything like that. Where does it get this package? There's a community out there for chocolate, there's a community out there for box server, and there's several other communities that have some packages you can install. And uh, what it will do is it will, it will look at all those, all those um, sources. And then you can download it and install that. So yeah, we're going to have to find that. So this is a good example of what it comes up for the for this install session. So as you see, if you can see the, um, you can see this there. You can press Control C to stop it. But the last one is the auto log and password. And what that is, it it has to reboot your 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 uh, machine. You know, use this password. Does that make sense? Are any questions? So what's out there? Very popular tools are out there right now. This was created by the community. And you can create your own too. You can create your own package. I, I didn't go into this as a lightning talk, but uh, I didn't go into uh, describing how to create packages. But these are just some examples of tools out there. At last count, even on chocolatey, I think I saw over 3,400 packages that were out there. So I was talking about that URL. Here's an example of a URL where you can install three different packages at once in my in my virtual instance, just like kind of separate. Now you can put this in IE, or you can put this you can put a start time in it and put that. Uh, but it won't work with Firefox or Chrome or anything like that out of the box. But you can put an add-on in to use the click once functionality because that's how it does it through IE and through that. Click once functionality. So, you know, it's very simple, but I'm going to show you how to create a repeatable install for yourself. So, the first thing you do is you compose an install script. So, here's an example. This is taken directly off the box starter site. And you can see the CN commands, those are chocolate commands. Those, that's, that's it. it. That's all you need. To install a package, just that line. So you can see the, the script itself is very simple. You just say, I want to install this. So the next step, you just save it anywhere. Anywhere you can get to it from like a, a network, like GIST or, or a NuGet P or a network share, or Bump Drive, uh, anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> so uh, the last step you do is run. So in this example, we used a gist, and the gist file one dot txt is what it runs, which with all those CS commands, it just goes and goes and does it. So I mentioned I mentioned like push installs too. It's really not that different from from a regular install. The first thing we have to do is on your remote machine, you have to do the uh, pgetmoney.flash force on your remote machine through PowerShell. The next thing you do in your client is you just uh, put in your install box starter package command line. And you can see the only difference here is this computer name. That's it. That will force the install. So what that does is it will download the package to your local repository. So with, with uh, Box store, you get a local repository where it stores all your packages that you downloaded and also ones that you uh, create your own. And then it will push it up to the remote instance. So, why are telling all this? We, uh, we were kind of challenged with uh, our ATD boot camp. For those of you who don't know, we are, we are actually creating an ATD boot camp, which has a uh, Kernel web, web shoe app, so it's a simple web app uh, with e um, tests written on it. And we're planning to get in class with this. So, so we're kind of challenged, we can handle it in but then we were challenged, well, how are we going to distribute this to the students? I mean, we didn't want to really pass out thumb drives and have them have a virtual machine on that, because they needed network connectivity for source code to go and stuff like that. So this was a perfect solution because 
we could set up the night before. It didn't take that long to do, and it was perfect. This is what we did. First thing we did, the first thing we do is right from scratch, we just created an Azure virtual machine. It's a small, small Azure virtual machine. And we wrote a script to install this software. So what we're going to do is we're going to anything we want. So I'll show you the scripts later. So then the next thing we do is we create a second virtual machine. And this is really kind of into chocolate, but um, the second virtual machine is going to get it for us. Superstar can help us. So we use Git for that. And we put our way to source as the root on that, on that Git clone. That's it. This step, this whole process takes about 45 minutes to do. Create one, one virtual machine and create a new one. <laughs> And create a second virtual machine, which is our source control manual. From there, it's simple. Uh, we uh, kind of set the requirement that we needed 16 students for this class at a maximum, so we need 16 virtual environments. So what we did, I've got to mention that with that source, the source control we did, was we created four branches. So it was going to have four students on one branch being able to control that. Being able to uh, control source there, so that was simple. All we had to do was clone the one instance 15 more times, and each student, each set of four students, connected to one of those branches. And uh, if, all this takes about an hour to do to set up this whole environment. So for us, that was huge. Not only that, we're using a trial version of the software. So once once all this is done, once the data training is done, then we just get rid of all the instances and we build up again. So, so here's our script. Uh, first on the top is our URL. So uh, yeah, we're using Nate's account right now, but that'll change. Sorry. Uh, so that's what we used to start. The second part of this is our script. That's our that's what spell script. All these chocolate things. It's everything's on community. So here's a source of, this has nothing to do with chocolatey again, but here is our source control management script. Um, you'll see that uh, this is all a bunch of git commands and stuff. So, uh, the, the last six lines you repeat for each environment so we can create as many branches as we want. So that's our basic script. That, all that takes about an hour to do. And most of it you're just doing nothing. So for more, you can go to box.org. Any questions? Is there an alternative to the or another future <laughs> product? Is this the one with more? I know people don't talk about it off the topic of the million business framework, and we use it by itself, but I would I would say most likely. Okay. I don't know if they handle all of the all of the things that Monster does on the computer. The re 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 and you can get it to a tag, it's from Chocolate, Elk, or uh, other stores. Uh, you know what I did? Yeah, okay. okay. okay like you know what I did? Yeah. Yeah, there's like a window. Okay, exactly. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah, and that's, and it happens to be around 10 to 10. Yeah. So it's going to be Okay. Yeah, we
out of that Chrome window if you didn't already. Chrome window, wherever that hangout was. Mine? I don't know, man. Is it? Can you hear it? Maybe four or five. I think this one works. Do you like this one better? Geek Chic is it's better than Android. I tried to play the spelling thing. It didn't work well. It confused everyone. What's that? <laughs> so that one doesn't work either. Are you being? You're being. Yeah. Okay. Good thing you have uh, shear cutters. <laughs> Cut that tongue off. <laughs> yeah. I have since taken them down. So everybody back. <laughs> we still waiting? We're missing the other Kevin. Oh, the more important Kevin. That's right. The new Kevin. Skinnier Kevin. Without you. Evil Kevin. Okay. <laughs> uh, just a quick reminder for everyone. Uh, on the back of the forums, we also have feedback uh, that you guys can need for our group in particular. Uh, we decided to separate those into uh, uh, group feedback and uh, center feedback. Yeah. We'd appreciate it if you guys could supply comments. Make sure you put fives in all of them. <laughs> Thank you. If there's any topics that you want to hear or if there's any suggestions you want to do differently in the future. Or also, we're planning on doing a workshop in March that Nick was talking about. If there's any topic you want to focus on, let us know. <laughs> there you go, Vince. Vince, remember to fill that up. Well, all right. So, we've done a lot of JavaScript stuff lately. <laughs> and I've, I've been given a lot of crap about that, so I thought I'd change it up a little bit. I gave this one at Code Camp uh, a couple weeks ago. So, I'm going to try and make it a little more technical. Uh, Riley seen this one, so I think it'll I think it'll help uh, clear the water on what these wearable technologies can do. So the idea is this: I was <coughs> thrust into Java development. <laughs> .NET developer by trade for 10 plus years. Made a Java developer to make my uh, boss is happy. <laughs> so I'm not a Java expert, but I do like new technical crap. I like to buy toys. You know, I like to buy that type of stuff. So I want to, I want to know how they work. 
and that's how that's how this thing was born. So I'm not going to purport to be some type of expert of anything from any of these technologies. So bear with me, but I will show you my learning pains along the way, and that's kind of what this is. So the whole thing's a just me as a dude walking into Android development from nowhere. So it, it all comes down to this Internet of Things. Like, you've got everything connected to everything. Why do we need that? Why do we want that? So we have health and fitness. Now we're quantifying. We're self-quantifying. Calories, grams of fat. Now we're down to eliminating gluten. Nobody knows what the heck gluten is. Next week it'll be, who knows, whatever food is a different color. So then we took away money. Now that's electronic. Now we're getting into the cars. We're starting to be able to start our cars from our phones. We're starting to be able to start them from our computer. We can locate our phone from the computer. Like everything's so connected, it's like where does it, like how does this connectivity begin? <clears throat> and now we're getting into wearable technology, and that's what this type of thing is about. So my interest lies in the watch specifically, and that's going to drive it. And a lot of us will be writing these types of apps soon. <clears throat> They're going to figure out ways to use them. They're going to want us to write apps that help, I don't know, figure out insurance rates. Who knows? They'll come up with something. So my idea is how can we utilize this? And I'm a Michigan fan. So my buddy calls me up. Come up to OSU. So I come up to OSU <laughs> to uh, visit my buddy. I'm wearing this hat, this Michigan hat. He doesn't tell me like what we're getting into. And I walk into this. <laughs> I'm like, oh crap! What am I supposed to do? I'm about to get a beat down. So I do this. I switch my hat to Ohio State fan. Now I'm incognito. So <clears throat> that works. That's wearable technology. That's you know the idea. And so think about this one. Where is this going? I'm like, what can I do with this watch? <laughs> Riley with a smartwatch right there. It's cool. But anyways, the whole gist of that is the internet of the things. What are we going to do? Excuse me. So the idea is, why do we need this? I mean, Apple's putting millions of dollars into it. Android's putting, or Google's putting millions of dollars into it. We've got the Oculus Rift. We did see that Google Glass was abandoned. Why? But we have these watches. So I want to focus on that. So Android, what they've done, they have the mobile operating system. And they want to pare it down and make stack specific versions of Android that all tie back to some type of base. So you have the Android Wear, which is about the wearable stuff, the auto, and the television now. So you've seen the Chromecast, and you've seen Android TV, which failed, and they brought back, or Google TV, now it's Android TV. So it's all within the same blanket. And they all will execute on the same devices. So that's pretty cool. So I think it's a consolidation effort. If you notice, and if you pay attention to what iOS and Android are doing, they're getting to a point of feature parity. Now it's like, what hardware do you prefer? They all do the same thing. 
So which one do you want? Well, I mean, is it thinner? Is it does it not bend in your pocket? Does it is it bigger? But they all do the same thing. I mean, really, they do. So Google's driven by Google now, which is the Surrey of the Google world. And now you have Cortana with the Microsoft world. And Lord knows what else is out there. <coughs> but now let's get into the development side of things. So the API in Android Wear is developed to help you communicate between the phone and these devices. So the communication is the important thing. So I'll touch on this a few times in here. Your phone is essentially a hub. It's a client server kind of deal where the phone or becomes the uh, the brains and the watch and everything else is a thin client. So the watch or the hat or Riley's mullet, those are all thin clients to through the phone and they do the phone does all the processing. That way you can save battery and do stuff like that. The brains are the operations of your phone. And eventually, who knows? Maybe your phone won't be. So there's it, it's a pretty heavy stack. Um, it's a typical Java scenario in my book. And this is coming from a .NET to a Java realm. It's a heavy stack. you got to learn a lot of new things. So you've got your Android SDK. You've got your IDE. You've got your IntelliJ IDE, which is called Android Studio. And those of you who in here has heard of JetBrains? Yeah. They make Android Studio. So those guys, the same guys that do ReSharper or RubyMine, which I saw you had in your installer, <coughs> those types of things, Android Studio, which I'll show here in a little bit. It's pretty awesome. And they have a, a mantra. It's called uh, for developers by developers. It couldn't be more true. Those guys know what the heck they're doing. So, oh, yeah, the SDK docs, we all hate documentation, all of us. Well, maybe it's just me. I don't know. But their documentation is fantastic, and they actually think about so, like, if you're going to play with this stuff, dig into the documentation. They have examples right there in the bottom of every explanation of API that shows, like, oh, man, like, how does that work? And then they have an example that shows you how it works. It's awesome. Really well written. written. <clears throat> so what I wanted to show is, and I'm kind of getting through the, the early stuff quickly, an Android application is delivered as one package. It's one file that goes to both the watch and the phone. So it looks like this. So if you look at the overarching, we'll come back to that. This is the package you download. Like when you go out to the Google Play Store, you download both. And when it installs, it automatically pushes it to either your automotive, your refrigerator, whatever it's tied to, the watch, whatever. So these guys get pushed out, and it becomes this ecosystem to where you don't know specifically without checking. If you're not checking in code, you don't know where it's executing. It gets into a, a, a very interesting scenario. So you can have, you can request assets from the watch that could be pulled from the phone by URI. That's weird to me. So it goes ahead and underneath the covers proxies a request for a URI into a content management. And if, it, if you have it locally on your watch, it'll pull it there. If it's on the phone, it'll go through and pull it via Bluetooth back to the watch. 
And API-wise, you're not doing anything differently. Unless you need to know if you're coming from the phone or the watch. But if you use the standard APIs, it's pretty cool. So you made it kind of seamless. So you're saying the watch, the wearable can go directly to the internet? Via the phone, yes. Okay. Oh, via the phone. Only via the phone. It proxies it out, yeah. Yeah, and I tried it with sockets. Yeah, it, that's pretty cool. <clears throat> so the user interface comes into question. You know, you have uh, you have this tiny little device, which I meant to pass around. If you guys haven't seen one of these, yeah, there it is. Here's one. Pass this guy around. <clears throat> So you have that little small screen, I mean, and you have a thumb, and my thumb's big, it covers up the whole thing. So what they've done is they've studied the living crap out of how to best utilize that real estate. And you end up with this. This is what they think, via studies and via time, is the best way to manage that real estate. So you get this, you get cards and pages and activities and intents. And that's something I want to harp on for a second. And this is something I learned in Android. So you have an intent. You can subscribe to an intent. Like, I intend to listen to, and who's downloading the application, it pops up with those little, these are the permissions that you must accept to install this. That's the intents telling that. Because to subscribe to those intents, I need those permissions. So for instance, I as one application can listen to anything that comes across Facebook. How can I do that? Because I intend to. So you can do the same thing with text messages. And, you know, a person can just accept my permission. And I can look at every text message that comes in and reply to all their friends without them knowing. If they accepted my permissions. It gets kind of hairy. But this is how it works. So, this is their intended model for how these applications are supposed to work. They want you to go across and down, and cross and down, or up. They want it to drive that way. It's like, this is a sample, this one's no fun. But everything's done with layouts. You've done WPF, I know that. Very, very similar to WPF. If you haven't done WPF, your layout of your visual user interface is done via XML files. You describe your components via XML. And what it will do is parse the XML and put it into code and construct it. Now, you don't have to put it in XML. It makes it more flexible, especially given the plethora of screen sizes, dots per inch, form factors, languages. So you want things to be as dynamic as possible. You don't want to hard code text box here, you know, that type of stuff. Everyone's been burned on that. So here's an example of one. It's defining text box, scroll view, and I'll show you the application that's that this is executing here in a second. It, uh, I mean, it's, it's very, I mean, if you've done C Sharp or Visual Basic or something like that, is it too small? No. no. It is very verbose. It is very verbose, yes. So the same thing like Max Parent. I feel like they default to that. <coughs> That's me doing that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, that has to do with like uh, layout size. Okay. So the layout size, I'm saying match parent, and the parent is actually trying to fill the screen. So you can nest all this, and he, he brings up a good point. 
I mean, trying to satisfy every environment is horrendous. I'll show you another example. Now you just don't have different square sizes, you have round. So then the round throws everything off, and that throws off all your design aspects. So you're like, what are you going to do there? So here's an example that we'll play with here in a second. We have a square. And that designer, that is what's generated from the Android Studio in its like designer renderer. So that's the preview. Cool. All right, well, that looks neat. Here's an example of how it breaks down. And this is the same with all Android apps, by the way. I'm just focused on the wear right now. It's the same thing for all the different devices. So this isn't special in any way. It's just there's a uh, drop down up there. I just put it in form factor of square watch. Could be a Nexus 4, could be a Nexus 5, could be a Samsung Galaxy S5 or S4, or S3, Moto. Excuse me, G3 could be, who knows, whatever phones are out there. Now, here's where it gets tricky. So, we have that XML layout and we defined it, but we want to request content. So, here's where you have to define your, your layouts via code. And one of the things in Android is they define fragments. And a fragment is a UI component, just like a control essentially. And that's essentially what these are. So it gets more complicated. I want to just skip through this piece here, but this is this is what's happening. So if you look here, your wearables are kicking through your phone and it can get to anywhere anywhere it needs to go. Everything can communicate with everything. And that's the important fact to know. I mean, does it matter what protocol you're using? I don't care. I make a request to this guy. He's happy. He's just brokering requests. So, you start getting into this. Basically, all this boils down to either your app is listening when it's open or is listening when it's open and it's not open. So, and it's the same, all these concepts translate to iOS. And I assume it's similar to Windows as well. But, like I said, everything seems to be approaching some type of feature parity. So, <laughs> This is a similar concept. So these are the key aspects to communication between the watch and the phone and the internet. We'll skip on that. Wearable listener service. This thing kicks on a long running service that runs when your app is open or not. And these are, these are the ones that people hate. These are the ones where they go into like whatever service monitoring thing they got going on. These are the ones that register right here. You define those via attributes and your XML. Nobody wants those. So here is basically a message API. You want your data to be serializable. It has to go back and forth across the wire. What's good about this, and I put this up specifically, because what I found is uh, polling for data will keep the phone or watch in an active state so it can never sleep. So you have to think about these types of things when you're working on a mobile device. You have to be aware that your potential to burn battery is there. So you don't want to fry the battery by 
you know, opening connections and keeping things away. So if it tells you you got something, that's preferable to me checking to see if I got something. That way I don't have to wake the thing up. How many hours of battery life you get on that? Mm -hmm. On that watch? Uh, Twelve. It, I swear it's the same if you have it on the whole time or if you don't. I can't figure out why. Is that a feature of Bluetooth like that allows you to not do polling or no polling? Or? Bluetooth 4.0? Uh, like what allows you not to pull it? These use, these use uh, Bluetooth 4.0 low energy. Um, that's part of the Android API spec. It actually supports every Bluetooth protocol I've seen. Like if uh, Bluetooth defines specifications, they look like GUIs. You ever seen yeah, yeah. Like you can ask a device, what do you support? You'll see something like A2DP. Yeah, you'll see something. Yeah, and then the last digits might tell you. That thing will, that thing supports everything. Like it'll, Pump over to, yeah, it, it'll do anything you want, but it's a pulse thing. And you'll see when I turn that thing on, the latency. Let's skip through that. So there's an example of what the messages look like back and forth. You've got and this looks the same on both sides. So you have to implement that on both sides, not just one side. That took me a minute to figure out. It's not like I implement this and I implement this on one side. You basically have to implement the same thing on both sides. That confused me for a second. So you're writing two apps? Yeah. You have to write what they call a companion app. Like if you want to communicate with the phone, even if it has no user interface, you have to write a companion app just to communicate with it. It's kind of silly, but that's just how it works. <laughs> Same thing with the watch. It's just literally a listener service. It's just something to install that Starts a service. That's it. Is the background process? Mm -hmm. For the it's for the ed and for the NSA. <laughs> yeah. Right. Where are our watch? <laughs> Duh. <laughs> and the freemium advertisements I'm sticking in the background. This same thing. I'll skip through that. Now here's a heavier data API. So there's one that where you only communicate with streams. This one you can actually throw full-blown objects into it. It really boils down to the same thing. So you have an API where you can chuck strings, and there's a separate API which uses the same thing as a string one to chuck full-blown objects. It's really the same. It, they're the same thing. I don't know why they overcomplicate it. This should be the whole. I mean, the string thing, yeah, cool for demonstration purposes, but this is what you're going to be doing. And it just chucks this data map item, name value pair. And if you stream it, like you can do like megabytes worth of data, which you don't want to do over Bluetooth, so whatever. Anyways, here's another one. So another service you may need to implement, back to where the Facebook thing I was talking about, where I want to listen to things going on on the Android system, an intent service, I can listen to anything that's happening as long as you approve that I can do it. I request it. I can do it. That's how you do it. So it gets kind of weird. Somebody adds a new contact. I can look at it. That's the point of Facebook, I guess. I was trying to sneak around it, decompile it. What they try to do when you add a new contact is see if you already have them in your Facebook. 
and then try and pair it up. Same when you get a text. They do some weird stuff. It's kind of freaky. So you can listen and do anything you want within the Android environment as long as they approve. And let's face it, most people will say, OK. <clears throat> notifications, same thing. We're all familiar with notifications and what pops up on them your wrist and your phone and you scroll down. <coughs> and all those intense memory that's, that's on the phone side, because that's where everything really happens? Both sides. Okay. Uh, the watch also has intense. It, uh, can re it, it releases its own intense. Some it delivers back to the phone. And I'll show that too. <coughs> so when I want the phone to display a notification, I produce an intent to show a notification. And the phone picks up on it and then displays the notification. And vice versa. So, and this is back to the design side. Think about glanceability. You don't want someone having to, I mean, don't text and drive. Now we got these watches and stuff, and you're just <laughs> staring at surfing the internet. So <laughs> you don't want to be doing that. Let's take a look at. Is that big enough? Yeah, there's your intense. <coughs> and what they did here, which is really cool, and I think this is a something you can get away with in Java that you can't get away with in our .NET realm as easily. They made the code compatible all the way back to like Android 2.2 or something. So as long as you use those compatibility classes that I highlighted here, it'll execute on like 2.2 to now, which 5.0 is starting to roll out. So you can add all the features you want, and this is what this is doing is, I'll show this too. This is uh, showing a notification. In every version of Android, it's kind of add a different feature, like one version adds the icon, one added like a ability to show a bigger notification, and each one is kind of progressive development. That compatibility guy. We'll take care of that. He'll only allow the features for the version of Android it's being run on. So rather than go through that, always use the compatibility classes if you're worried about backwards compatibility. If you're not, don't bother. Just another thing I learned. So we'll show the demos. <laughs> Huh? Do you watch? Nah. I got the emulators up. So this is what I wanted to show. I called in a lot of since you made it. <laughs> You're already wearing one, dude. Where'd it go? <clears throat> it was just up here. Mm. Don't crash them. Uh, yeah. ah, that's all right. Oh, no. Something about switching the... So, anyways, this gives me a chance to show this. You have Jenny Motion. When you download the SDK, you want to fire up emulators that will show you and allow you to work with it. You might not have the phone. You might not have that version of Android. You might not have any of those other things. So <clears throat> the emulator allows you to create an environment that will give you exactly what you're targeting without owning 10,000 devices. 
So here I have a watch that is exactly the same as that watch. I'm running the exact same software that's on that watch. We'll start it. And this is from Google. Now this Jenny Motion thing that I'm using, what it does is it uses VirtualBox. And it uses VirtualBox to emulate the phone because it's faster than Google's own emulators. But because it uses hardware uh, virtual machine extensions, I can only have one virtual one running at a time. So I use Jenny Motion for the more heavy one, which is the phone, and then I use software emulation for the watch. This one? They're the same one. Like it's a duplicated screen. Yeah, this is total inception stuff. So. <laughs> it's gonna blast out my screen. Can you see it now? Yeah. Till they screwed on my whole mojo, man. This one here? Are you good? If I shrink this, is it going to kill you? <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Hey, I like that mullet one. Uh. Yeah, Movember. So that's another thing. I I don't know what it is about like uh, when you switch screens and stuff. It it kills the emulators in both environments. So I don't know. I don't know what it is. Java based? No, they're not all Java based. So there's that's our. A, that's a watch on the left, right? On the right. I mean, on the left. <laughs> That's the new iPhone 6 watch. 6 Plus watch. <clears throat> so when that thing boots up. So if you notice on the right, you got me all confused. <laughs> on, the right, on the right, the cloud means it's not connected. Neither of these support Bluetooth. So within the emulation environment, you got a fudge. Uh -oh. You gotta be kidding me. So I didn't want that Google Plus. I'm gonna put the Google Plus on. Don't do live demo. I can't do live demos if I can't use the computer. Do you still have to like turn off or, or dual boot into Windows to use the hardware emulation? See, so it just killed off the. Usually, it just kind of picks up where you left off in the emulator. Here, it detected a crash. It's just going to reboot the whole thing. So now, I love how it tells me my battery's going dead. Uh, okay. <laughs> you can turn that off and on. You can turn every feature off and on in the emulation world. So, all right, here we have on the left a phone. Here on the right we have the watch. Now, the trick here, they're not connected to each other. So what I'm going to do is use the Android debug bridge to get them to talk to each other. I'm going to forward the port that Bluetooth would normally use 
to advertise, which is 5601, I think. Yeah. To the phone. <clears throat> so now that that's forwarded, I'm going to kick on Android Wear because now it thinks it's probably a new watch. Now I'm going to pair it. Hope that works. I should pair. Let's just do this one more time. I keep looking up there. But the point of the matter is, this is how you're going to develop it. Unless you own both devices. Yeah. Yeah, there they go. So now we have a whole environment to write these applications on. And this is getting long winded, but here's a walkthrough of the actual watch. And I'll bring this one up. So, this is why I wanted to show. And this is one of the important things that I think needs to hit home. <clears throat> if you look at this. Square main activity app. This is a basic app that really does nothing except show a notification, kill itself, and start another application. <clears throat> it, uh, you're like, oh, okay, cool. This looks nice and all. But what, do, what about when I do this? What about when I want to target a, a round watch? I don't know, man. Have fun, striker. But they, <laughs> that's going to be miserable for all of us if we have to target different form. I mean, what if somebody wants to make a diamond one or something, or a, a triangle? So it's going to be that's it changes everything. So let's just stick with the easy one. <clears throat> but and then it gets more complicated now. It's like, all right, I'm using straight from the source editor they gave it to me awesome notice any difference why is that different I don't know <laughs> I do not know I've tried to figure it out it's the same application literally the same application same resolution same DCI everything Oh, wow. Everything's the same. Uh -huh. I don't know. The point I'm trying to drive home is don't trust the other. It's kind of a gentle guide to where you're going. But always use an emulator and preferably the, re the, tr the real deal. Use the phone or the watch or whatever. And that's another thing. You can deploy the watch app to the phone and the phone app to the watch. And it won't gripe at you. So, so there you go. So there I just showed an app or a notification. It says come, but this is a really long text. I wrote this at Code Camp on the fly just to see how big it could get. But there's your thing. But tying to a notification, you can give options. So here, launch activity. An activity is an application, essentially. It really is. It's the core piece of an application. You can have multiple activities within an application. We want to see what it does. And there you go. Here's and the thing is keep it keep it down by the you want to keep most of that interaction down where the thumb's gonna work. So this one just shows you the rows and the columns using a simple grid view control. 
Now here's one I want to do with the Internet of Things. What if you had a internet connected toilet? <laughs> You went to Chipotle. <laughs> Twice. <laughs> In the same day. You've got this app. My application. It's, her <laughs> it's got the toilet paper roll. Yeah, there you can see why it's slow. So there. <laughs> <laughs> How much Chipotle did you eat? You can fix your toilet. How many gallons per flush do I want to use? It's like, damn, I ate a lot of Chipotle today. It can That's warn you. That's a lot of gallons. <laughs> and then this one. <laughs> and then it, <laughs> you can call plumber. Boom. Internet of things. So <laughs> these are the types of things that are possible with this silly stuff. What are we going to do with it? You guys tell me. People are going to pay us to do it. So let's take a look at the code real quick. <laughs> I threw that one together. <laughs> that was a good one. I'm pretty almost done. Thing is, I, like I wanted to get into the code stuff, but the code gets really heavy and complicated. <laughs> so what I wanted to show was another example of. Here we have the phone. Dang it. The size is so much different over here. Thanks. That lock up. <clears throat> so this one I wanted to show how to communicate to the watch. Now the notifications, and this is all important, and it's like I'm not going to, without anyone playing with the actual APIs and stuff, I'm not going to really dictate anything. I'd rather give high level ideas so you can do it. But these notifications have a basically a GUID or a UUID tied to them. So if I want to kick one over to the watch, I can tie some information to it so that I can still control it from the phone. Otherwise, it's a fire and forget. So if I fire and forget it and it pulls up on the phone, then I can't do anything with it. So this one, coming from the phone, I'm going to kick over. Oh, why it keeps dropping that connection? Yeah, what's that all about? You doing that? Some of you doing that from the Google Plus? Yeah, it's the Internet of Things. It's the toilet. The toilet's busting my phone. It's incredible how much is actually happening here, though, when you think about it. Everything's emulated. They're all communicating, simulating. I don't know, radio signals, it's just... Well, the, wa the phone one worked. I don't know what's going on there. But... I don't know why the watch one's not working, man. Well, that's, that sucks. Oh, yeah, thanks. Okay. <laughs> I'll probably have 10 of them. No, I have it. If it's the same minute, it won't send another one. So 
it's just shooting over a notification using the code I showed earlier with that compat. And the interesting thing about the code, which I could pull back up, that's the same code you would execute on the phone to send to the watch as you execute on the watch to send to the phone. So they've done a really elegant job of making these devices like very interoperable so you don't necessarily know what you're operating with if you don't care. So why would I, I mean if I want to send a notification from my refrigerator saying I'm low on milk to my phone, it's the same code I'd send from my watch to my refrigerator to say I got more milk. You know what I mean? So they've done a really cool job of this. It's really neat. I don't know. <clears throat> so it, it's just an interesting, fantastic environment to work in. I wish I could get more into the code, but I think it's just it's not in the cards tonight. <clears throat> really neat. Where's the last one? Yeah. Here's your companion app on the phone. This is what it looks like. That's it. Right? Yeah. Is it swipe around or something? No. Or just because that's just a listener? Yeah. It's just a listener. No. It's never meant to be launched. I just added it to be launched just to show. All it does is kick off those services, and once those services are kicked off, they're running until it's, the app is uninstalled or not. It's listening for data, sending data, snooping on your whatever -ness. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, you can say, OK, Google, the mic doesn't work on this, but you can type stuff. These are the default ones. <clears throat> so they just don't work. It sits there and spin. The emulator is pretty busted. I mean, if you're going to do any serious watch emulation, use the actual device. Yeah, use the watch. I mean, there's no. I've tried. Yeah, see, nothing happens. It's just. I don't know. So I'd like to get more into development, but <clears throat> it really, there's so many moving parts. It's really complicated figure out how to demonstrate them. But I encourage everyone, download these tools. They're all in the presentation. I put the links there. I'll put it out on Google Plus or wherever Mac makes me send them. Whatever. Is it Facebook Rad or something? OK. But they're, all the links are there. Download it. It's free. That's the cool thing about Android. You don't have to have a Mac. Cost entry to a Mac is expensive. Unless Cardinal's paying for it, which they only give to specific people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what are you going to do? But you can do both on the Mac because this is all Java based. So, anyways, I don't know. George, you're a Microsoft band yet? <laughs> huh? Where's your Microsoft band yet? No. <laughs> no. A little health uh, monitor, Captain. Should be better. Only weighs a pound. Only weighs a pound. Was that what they were advertising? And supposed to be big. Shield? Did anyone watch that? No. It looks kind of big. Cool. Looks kind of big. So if you were yeah, to. I saw that. I just told the watch to play that from my phone. And that's just such a simple thing, but it's like, how connected are we going to get? You know? I don't know. So what app are you working on now for your watch? Sites, uh, Mickey. Oh, just, uh, just, just a toilet thing. Just a toilet thing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I just, uh, yeah, I have no aspirations. 
maybe a Flappy Bird clone <laughs> or something. But it was. I just wanted to discover why. What is important about this? Why are people clamoring? Why is every article stuck in my mailbox about this wearable stuff? Why is it expensive? I got an Oculus Rift sitting at home. I haven't touched yet. That's the next thing. In the <laughs> I, I want to see where the money's at. Dollar, dollar bill, y'all. Show me that dough. Keep your wallet stacked. I've never watched a lot. He's found them down. But I know these toys. It won't be, right? Hey. Watch that. I don't know. I'm curious about the packaging and distribution. Is that the same model for all of the verticals? So the wearables, the auto, TV? It's hard to know. Okay. Because it seems to make sense for those sort of devices where it's going to be paired with one phone. Right? Mm -hmm. But your TV, you probably going to have multiple devices that could interact with it. Now I installed an app so it's on my phone. If I'm download a different version of that app or don't have it on your phone. That's where it starts to get out of the Yeah. And I that actually happened today. Because I on my phone like a dummy, I upgraded to the Android L five O factory image, which unpaired it with the watch. So I had to resync it. There's an option to resync the apps across devices. So it resynced the watch portions back to the watch without me needing to refresh the watch. So it's smart, and there's an intent. Intents, I consider events. Like, really, it's an event. There's one where it's like first install. That seems to be where people are doing a lot of watch type setup, which I'd imagine would be there, maybe detect other devices and shove it out the door or whatever. You know. I mean today I was playing with this stuff and this Bluetooth hacking, we can have some fun with it right now. Because I know there's and wire with Wi Fi stuff, but uh, for instance the TVs at the uh, La Pagata next to me, they're all direct TV, Bluetooth powered. No pen, no pen number. I tied right to the TVs and didn't. I didn't do anything. But could show off all the TVs. I could stop watching Lady Gaga and put on something else. Who knows? But I think it, I, I don't know. You, and you can do all that from that, too. It's just as powerful. The Bluetooth API is completely wide open. You can do anything you want. It doesn't have Wi Fi, but it'll proxy it right through your phone. <laughs> but the watch, in the, in the Android Wear 2.2 update, which is pushed about a week ago, you don't have to be tethered to your phone anymore. So you can still use all the sensors. You can still. Yeah, so it's got four gigs of storage. It's a standard baseline model. So you can jog with it without your phone or whatever. You power your Bluetooth headphones, you know, stuff like that. Emulators. That's pretty cool. Flappy Bird. <laughs> Candy Crush. Mario for that. Is that your favorite thing? I don't know. You just made eye contact. So it's scary. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's what games do you play, Mario? <laughs> Anyways, that's it. I hope that helped, man. Like, nobody seems to be into this.